A jewel on the face of the world's northwestern hemisphere, Canada, with its luminous wonders, has its outstretched sceneries for the eyes of the beholder to explore. From the prairies to the mountains, Canada is certainly unique. Generously sired and elegantly crafted by nature, through many cycles of change that consist of some of the world's most astounding landmarks, Canada enchants travelers with its many bountiful offerings. One of these offerings is the easternmost provinces of Newfoundland and Labrador, hidden away on the east coast of Canada, a place of floating mountains of ice to historic sites and exhibits that take you back in time. Our journey begins with St. John's, the provincial capital of Newfoundland and Labrador, which is located on the eastern tip of the Avalon Peninsula on the island of Newfoundland. It is the most populous in the province. The city enjoys a long and vibrant history as the oldest English-founded city in North America. The St. John's is the fastest growing metropolitan area in Newfoundland and Labrador. The harbour was a frequent haven for European fishermen throughout the early 1500s and was officially established as a community when Sir Humphrey Gilbert declared Newfoundland an English colony in 1583. We are now in the oldest city in Canada, St. John's. St. John's sits on a deep water harbour connected by the Narrows a long inlet to the Atlantic Ocean. The city's celebrated history has seen many an era of change, both economic and social. Its traditions and old structures maintained through the years have merged with the changes of a new age, making this unique city an amalgamation of the new and old. Its winding and hilly streets are lined with small, modest buildings of shops, homes and businesses, giving it a pleasant and welcoming and colorful feel. With a long and prosperous history in the fishery industry, the last half of the 20th century has seen St. John's transformed into a modern export and service center. The city has stood the test of time. More recently, its proximity to recently discovered offshore oil fields has led to an economic boom that has spurred population growth and commercial development. St. John's weather patterns are quite unique. Though blessed with a moderate climate that is not too hot or cold, it is recognized as the foggiest, windiest city. It is also the recipient of the most freezing rain. For a city with a mere area of 446 square kilometers, St. John's houses many extremes of weather patterns. One unique stop was the one and only Mile Zero emanating from the heart of St. John's downtown. Mile Zero marks the beginning of the famous Trans-Canada Highway that carries travelers on an extensive 4,849 mile journey all the way to British Columbia, the westernmost province of Canada. Mile Zero's appeal lies in a uniquely carved dial on the pavement that indicates a number of key destinations along with the distance one has to travel to reach them. We are in, the, in front of the city of St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, this is the point zero. In Canada and everywhere in the world, the mileage is always measured from either the city hall, and in some villages where there is no city hall, they use the Canada Post. So this is where the Trans-Canada begins. St. John's, Newfoundland, or St. John's, which is in Newfoundland and Labrador, is the most easterly city in Canada. This is where Trans-Canada begins, Trans-Canada Highway begins. This is point zero, and this is the mark. This historic site celebrates the rich communication and military history of Signal Hill. It sits amidst a spectacular view of St. John's and the sea. Signal Hill was a reception point of the first transatlantic wireless signal by Guglielmo Marconi in 1901. 
It also has the distinction of being the site of harbor defenses for St. John's from the 18th century to the Second World War. Even today, to reminisce these significant parts of St. John's history, 19th century military drills are held. My name is Gareth McGraw, and I'm a historic interpretator for Signal Hill. Signal Hill here is most renowned for being the first place in the world to receive a transatlantic wireless signal. This was done by Guglielmo Marconi in 1901, where his assistant in Poldu, England, sent a wireless message from England over to here, where Marconi received it using two large box kites to hold up an antenna. The transatlantic signal later on led to every invention you know, coming up, including cell phones, uh, AM, FM radio, laptops, Wi-Fi, and just a complete change of the world today. The view of the night is completely in contrast to that of the day. Fog covered and alone, Signal Hill exudes an almost foreboding presence with the silence of the night broken by the trespass of the paws of another more inquisitive visitor. The adjacent town's lights give the impression of a tapestry of candles that are defined in the heart of darkness, giving a historical reminder of how the troops stood their grounds in preserving the values of freedom that today's generations enjoy. We continue onward to the easternmost part of the North American continent, the ever-vigilant site of Cape Spear. Since the mid-1800s, the lighthouse at Cape Spear has been standing like a beacon in the pitch blackness of the night, guiding seafaring travelers to its rocky shores. Having seen two centuries of change, the lighthouse's beacon has been fueled from oil, then electricity, then a dioptric system. Initially built as a tool of keeping a watch on the intruders during the Second World War, it is a reminder of the hardships the finest of Canada went through to preserve her shores. Assuming the role of a defensive platform, Cape Spear was tread by Canada's heroes and almost always ablaze with the fury of gunfire that held the line against invaders. We are at the most easternly point in North American continent and when we look to the west, we are looking at all of North American continent. And as you can see behind me, which is again the most easterly point, is the vastness of the Atlantic Ocean. And if we continue from here, we'll um, reach Europe. And from St. John's, from this point, Vancouver is further than London, England. So London, England is closer in distance than Vancouver, Victoria, BC. The uh, different species of whales that you will find in this water at this time of the year is uh, mink whale, fin whale, um, as well as humpback whale, which can weigh up to three tons or 16 meters uh, in, uh, and 40 tons, sorry. Uh, they can weigh up to 40 tons and in excess of 16 meters long. The next site we visited only further astounded us with its remarkable natural contrast of weather. This is Twillingate. A small island in the North Atlantic, Twillingate is one of the most picturesque outports in all of Newfoundland and Labrador. With a rich history, Twillingate has maintained much of its old charm and the people celebrate this destination every year through several events. Perhaps Twillingate's most striking feature comes in form of cold, frozen ice. Located on the edge of what is known as Iceberg Alley, Twillingate is affectionately known as the iceberg capital of the world. Many of these 10,000 year old giants float quietly by each year and people travel great distances just to chance a glass.
In spite of warmer climates at this time of year, the icebergs persevere in their chilly and frozen structures, drifting lazily in defiance of the warmer weather. The icebergs, in spite of their long, untiring journeys of 10,000 years, are commonly known around the world, seize the imagination when beheld by the eye. It would almost be overwhelming to comprehend the fact that the larger amount of these frigid giants lies under the water. What we see on the surface is now commonly phrased as the tip of the iceberg. Always fascinating, always gleaming, splendidly on the still waters, their journeys from Greenland is as if to add to the already picturesque scenery of Twillingate. Huge chunks of ice have been gathering here for the thousands of years. Now we are on Twilling Gate, which is famous for the icebergs. Although it is the end of July, but you can still see the icebergs hanging around. The area is very beautiful and famous in the world for icebergs, particularly in summer. From Tullingate, we went to Grand Falls, Windsor and called upon Dr. Budden at his residence. Dr. Budden is also the president of the Newfoundland chapter of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Iceberg capital of the world. He shared some insights on Tullingate with us. Uh, from all over Canada and from all over the world, they come to Tullingate to see the iceberg and, now, and they like to uh, hear the iceberg, iceberg pop, you know, up and up, like a pistol shot. Uh, so this is a very great att attraction and uh, I'm not going to lecture on iceberg but this much we should know that this iceberg that come here they break away from Greenland glaciers and then they come through the Labrador Sea to, towards the uh, north of, uh, of Newfoundland but they are about 25,000 years old uh, they are very very old right? and nowadays we are having many m more icebergs and uh, we feel it's because of uh, global uh, warming. Dr. Budden also led the delegation to the medical facility where he practices as a neurologist. I am a neurologist. Uh, we prefer to say I am a specializing in neurology rather than using the term a neurologist because for sure we cannot cure all patients, we cannot treat all diseases, so we are still uh, trying to uh, perfect ourselves in that science. Dr. Budden's passion to serve the ailing reflects in this plaque, the likes of which are common in medical facilities and hospitals around Canada. This plaque recognizes the Ahmadiyya Muslim community's efforts for the betterment of mankind. The Atlantic salmon, or Salmo salar as it is classified scientifically, is an important part of the North Atlantic waters and has been a part of the habitat both as an ecological factor and as a huge delicacy. Once thriving as a species, the popular fish became endangered due to extensive hunting and natural predation. To ensure its survival and the revival of its life cycle, preservation and interpretation centers came about. This is why the Fish Ladder Seminoid Interpretation Center of Newfoundland plays an important role in the preservation of the Atlantic salmon. You're here at the Salmonid Interpretation Center where salmon make their annual spawning migration from June to September. So these are wild Atlantic salmon coming in from the ocean. And they're coming in from the, up the coast of Labrador and Greenland entering into the Bay of Exploits down in Botwood and heading up to the spawning grounds. So they will spawn in October, some will head back to sea after they spawn, some will overwinter and head out to sea in the spring. Most of the salmon on this river are grilts. That means they spend one year in the ocean and then they come back, so they tend to be smaller salmon, between three and six pounds. The biggest salmon we've seen on the river go through our ladder has been about 20 pounds. But you only see one or two like that. 
Large windows show visitors and salmon enthusiasts a close-up of the busy feeding fish. The purpose of the center in a capsule is to provide a familiar environment to the fish, both for feeding and spawning cycles. Using their natural method of jumping into bypasses in search of fresh water, yet unaware of the caring gaze of their human benefactors, the salmon used this diversion system built in 1987 to carry on their journey. The Grand Falls Dam, interjected into the system, provides power and water flow that help in various ways, one of them key to the salmon's travels. About 20,000 salmon use this bypass each year, spawn and feed, and are on their way to open waters of the Atlantic. To ensure every angle of research is complete, Radiotech is inserted into randomly selected salmon to better monitor their course. With the numbers of the fish returning to more assuring levels, the salmon's survival and through the mere facilitation of its habitat and migration is ensured. This is the way it should be, if alone for the reason to keep the balance in God's wondrously gifted world. As if concealing another jewel until it was ripe, Newfoundland introduced pleased tourists to the quiet and beautiful town of St. Anthony. Situated on the northern reaches of the Great Northern Peninsula of Newfoundland and Labrador, for a town barely noticed, St. Anthony has come a long way. Discovered by fishermen in the 1500s, it has since incorporated many changes, both in terms of its economy and social life. However, just like the other destinations on the outskirts of Newfoundland, St. Anthony's history reflects in its every corner. During our journey to the Atlantic shores of St. Anthony, we came upon a breathtaking view of a larger-than-life glacial mass These Leviathan-sized pieces of glacier most likely sat in the Arctic waters for several years, being carved and shaped by the wave action and summer sun before drifting to the coast of Newfoundland. Here, they slowly continue their transformation into the abstract art that draw thousands of tourists from all over the world to etch into their memories a sight they will never forget. Even local residents who have been viewing birds from their homes for all their lives cannot help to stop and observe these awesome phenomena. Many birds slowly drift by within view from shore, but some are pulled into the bays where they discover their fate, a slow melt from early spring until July. Often, they're held hostage by the seabed when they're grounded. They remain here until the tide frees them or they shed enough weight by calving large pieces to float. A calving or floundering bird makes a thunderous sound as it displaces huge amounts of seawater. A bird also takes on endless shapes 
as it melts from building size mammoths to bergy bits. Another frequently visited tourist attraction is the Norsted Viking Village. Pioneers, explorers, letting tourists know how the history of this beautiful town came to be. As if to outdo its attractions that were inspired and made by man, dolphins, icebergs and whales adore the shores around St. Anthony, with hundreds of tourists coming every season to catch but a glimpse of these wonders of nature. Throughout the trip, one thing that remained constant was the breeze that flew in from the powerful ocean surrounding the coast. One cannot but fathom at the uncountable leagues of the Earth's more commanding natural element, hence our mention of this ocean. Many of the sites that we are blessed with in this region are offerings of the Atlantic Ocean. No stranger to any human being, the world's second largest watery kingdom spans an impressive 106.4 million square miles and covers approximately one-fifth of the Earth's surface. Moving entire species of fish, huge clusters of gigantic icebergs, and crazy incredible. It is also home to some of the most unique powerful mammals in the sea, the whales. During our wondrous journey through the amazing East, we stumbled upon another unforgettable sight in a small fishing community. This is the uh, bones of a whale. Uh, a lot of whales come very close to the shore because the fish they come to hunt the fish and when the low tide or the tide recedes they get stuck uh, on the beach and uh, ultimately they die. As if charting a course from the new to the old the delegation's journey went from more recent outspoken discoveries to older ones which were quieter in context. As if to keep this momentum, the next, and for the duration of this trip, the final stop brought us closer to the origins of life on Earth. The delegation made the small, remote coastal town of Flowers Cove their final stop. In synonymy to the other places visited, Flowers Cove had its own little attraction, thromboids. Rocks to the eye, at first glance, these are, in fact, calcium carbonate growth structures of ancient bacteria and algae, the first known organisms to inhabit this planet, dating back some 3.5 billion years. Both rock and fossil-like, these are the only thrombites in existence in this part of the world, with the only other cluster known to be in Australia. Thrombites are theorized to having thrived in warm and salty waters, touched now only by the occasional feet of visitors or the gentle undulations of the ocean that caresses them. These thrombites are only a shell of the fact that is life. Even so, their presence invokes the fascinating thought of the fragility of life and how this world is a mere visiting point before the hereafter. The delegation took this fact in stride and offered Friday prayers on these very structures.
Our insight into the surroundings in Newfoundland is coming to a conclusion in this presentation. However, we would like to share our thoughts on this impressive trip of discovery and what we can expect in the near future. With its economy steadily rising and its embrace of the past seen in its hidden treasures, it is a place of both gradual progress, gratitude to the illustrious past, framed with the promise of serenity. With a fond proximity to nature and an ode to the past, it is a place whose colorful sceneries and friendly people cannot be missed. Whatever Newfoundland may be to its inhabitants, it is a lot more to the ones who come only for a visit, for its beauty and air of peace go with them making them long to return.